let's talk about Ethiopia and what you might see when you go there. Of course, the likelihood is you will start in Addis Ababa, meaning the new flower. It's been the capital for just over 100 years. It sits at about 2,400 meters above sea level, making it the third highest capital in the world behind Quito and La Paz. Um, and it's a really vibrant, buzzing, boomtown, basically. It's the home of the African Union, which is an organization of all African uh, countries. And every year it has a summit and, and, it, and it really feels like a kind of an important capital city. Lots of high rise buildings, a big financial district. It even has a sky train that runs through it now. So really different from the place that I first drove my motorbike into nearly 30 years ago. As far as tourism is concerned, the main tourist sites are the Holy Cathedral, the Holy Trinity Cathedral, uh, the Old Royal Palace, which is in a new Unity Park, um, the Ethnological Museum, and the famous National Museum, which is home to Lucy, the famous humanoid, uh, 3.2 million years old, which was found out in the Awash region, um, and uh, Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds by the Beatles was playing when they found it, which is why she's called Lucy. Fascinating. The Ethnological Museum and the National Museum are both brilliant and well worth going to. Uh, you can also go up onto Ntoto Hill, which sits about 400 metres above uh, the city to get a good eye view of the whole city. Um, there are some great restaurants. This is, the top right is the Habasha restaurant where they do uh, tribal dancing as well, which is fun while you eat. And the city is famous for its jazz clubs. And on bottom left, of course, is the infamous Wat and Injera, which is an acquired taste, which I do really like. Um, you may, you may not. Um, but then you're most likely going to get on one of these, an Ethiopian Airlines a small plane that will take you somewhere around the Northern Circuit. You can do it any which way you like, uh, but generally we're going to talk going uh, clockwise from kind of Addis being at six o'clock. We're going to go clockwise around uh, to Bahadar, up to Gonda, uh, across to Lalabella and, and back down again. If the schedules don't suit you and you have um, the, the wherewithal to, to, to hire your own plane, you can. They're little caravans. They're not radically expensive and they can cut down on quite a lot of time, particularly if you want to link the north with the south. Um, they can really save you a, a, at least a day, which can be quite handy. So those are available now in Ethiopia, just like you might find in Kenya or Tanzania while doing a safari. So we are traveling now north out of Addis up to Bahadar and Lake Tana. Lake Tana is the link really that the country had through ancient times with the ancient world, with Ethiopia. It's the source of the Blue Nile. Um, it's formed five, it was formed five million years ago by volcanic activity. Um, and there are around 30 islands on um, the, uh, in, in the lake. Um, and most of those are home to monasteries or churches. You take a little boat like this, and depending on how much time you've got, uh, dictates how many of these churches you can see. What you'll also see, and this dates back thousands and thousands of years, is the famous papyrus reed boats, which you'll still see bobbing around the lake, uh, either like this chap taking his firewood or fishermen uh, or people taxiing people on them as well. You can see them being made in the market as well. The most likely place you'll go to though is the Zagwe Peninsula where you'll see the uh, Ura Kidain Meret Church. This is the most famous church on the peninsula. It's pretty easy to get to um, and you know you can easily do this in a morning. And why it's famous, it was actually built in the 14th century originally, although this circular structure dates back to the 16th century, as do the incredible murals which line the uh, wall of the kind of inner sanctum. Um, it's also a stepping off point to go and see the Blue Nile Falls. Uh, now, um, this photograph I took in about, I'm guessing, but 2004, 2005. Since then, there's been a hydroelectric power station built, and therefore most of the water is no longer going over, unless you happen to travel to Ethiopia in the rainy season, which is between uh, kind of June, July, and August. Then you'll see plenty of water crashing over the famous Blue Nile Falls. This is really where the Blue Nile starts um, and of course weaves its way all the way down to Khartoum where the confluence is with the White Nile and from there it then heads on over into Egypt. 
and as I say, was the link between ancient Ethiopia and the ancient world. Traveling north um, along Lake Tana, you come to Agonda, the Camelot of Africa, as it's known. This is, this is really where Ethiopia starts to surprise you. I mean, as a 27-year-old young lad, pretty ignorant and not knowing too much about Ethiopia, I had no concept of what this country had uh, to offer. And when you get here, you really realize just what an amazing place it is. These, these castles date back to the 17th century. King Facilitas uh, ruled from here and, and his descendants for over 100 years in what was known as the famous Abyssinian Empire. Um, and they built these incredible churches that were kind of uh, castles, libraries, banqueting halls, and even a sauna. Uh, a traveling Portuguese salesman told one of the kings who had a skin problem that a sauna would help him, so he duly built one. Um, and the buildings are, are influenced by Indian, Nubian, Arab and Baroque architecture and are really quite extraordinary. Uh, the compound has many of these castles in it that were built by the various rulers over the years. Uh, the bottom left picture is Facilitad's Bath. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the Timcat Festival, uh, and the bottom right is the Deborah Bahan Selassie Church, which is just outside the castle complex and is famous for its incredible uh, ceilings and again its frescoes on the walls depicting the stories of the Bible. Um, one of the things we love to do in countries like Ethiopia is get our foundation working there. So Wild Frontiers has a foundation arm, the Wild Frontiers Foundation, and one of the things we do in Ethiopia is we sponsor a local girls football team. This is the Gonda Unity girls football team and they're brilliant. I went to go and train with them um, uh, one morning. Uh, there are 20 of them. They're all kids from very poor families and they just loved it. They, they, uh, they all get their kind of, you can see their sponsored shirts. They have a team, we get them to matches, we get them food, we get them showers. Um, and uh, the little girl down there at the bottom is actually the centre forward and captain of the team. She's called Hiwat, which means life. And she scored two goals in a 4-1 win over their great rivals the week before we got there. So this is something that we do to encourage the kids to, to, to have something to look forward to. And they just evidently loved it, which was really, really nice. Gonda is then the stepping off point into the famous Simeon Mountains. Now. Just looking at that picture, I can just see that it really has to be one of the most impressive sites on the whole of the African continent. I've traveled right the way around the African continent on my motorbike, and I can't think of anywhere more spectacular. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. It, 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 it's basically on an escarpment. So you, you walk along this escarpment, almost looking down on the mountains rather than up at them. It's a great place for walks. You can do anything from a two hour walk to a six day trek all the way up to the highest mountain in Ethiopia, which is Ras Dashan. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind the different times of year that you go there. This is a photograph I took last month. So that was uh, late March. Uh, if you go in October, you'll see it very different in green. Indeed, very, very green and lush. The rains come, as I say, between June, July and August. Uh, and, and sometime into September. By October, they've largely gone, and you're left with this incredible verdant land. So take your choice. It, it's wonderful either time of year. It doesn't really make a huge amount of difference, but it's, uh, yeah, you can see the difference. It's famous for its wildlife. Um, the famous gelada baboons, the endemic baboons that live there, which are pretty much habituated. You can get right up close to them. Uh, the ibex, which are less <laughs> easy to get up close to and indeed the simian fox or wolf sorry um and one of my favorite uh creatures that you see there is the lamagaya vulture uh, i've watched one afternoon when a lamagaya vulture swooped down on the carcass of of, a, of an animal uh, all the meat had been picked off it the only the bones were left the lamagaya picks up the bones takes it ab above rocks drops it on the rocks then comes down and eats the marrow and i think it's the only vulture that actually does that. So very impressive indeed. And there are great places to stay up there. Uh, the Simeon Lodge we stayed at, which is uh, a wonderful um, uh, place right up uh, actually in the Simeon Park. From there, it's very easy to go on walks, lovely rooms, a really nice bar and uh, dining area where you can have a nice glass of wine, 
or as I did, have a beer at the highest bar in Africa. You also have the Lima Liwa uh, Hotel, which is just outside the park, but again, offers the most spectacular views into the park. So you don't have to rough it up here. From Gondo, we traveled across to Lalibela. Now, Lalibela is going to be the highlight of most people's trips to Ethiopia, simply because of these extraordinary monolithic rock carved churches. Um, now, it, it was created, uh, so legend goes, during the reign of King Lalibela at the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 13th century. Um, it's believed or it's understood that they were um, created by men during the day and celestial beings during the night. So angels came down and helped them. Um, there are 11 churches in all, five on one side of the river and five on the other. And then St. George's, which is the one you can see top right, the most famous one as, as an outlier. Basically, King Lalabella was concerned that many of his, um, his subjects were doing pilgrimages to Jerusalem and they were dying on the way. It was a very dangerous journey. So he decided to create Jerusalem in Lalabella by creating these churches. Now, archeologists today believe that they were probably created over a much longer time span. These styles are very different. Some are incredibly carefully carved. Some are more rough and ready. Four are uh, self-standing like St. George's, which you can see there. Uh, the other uh, seven are have one side attached to uh, the rock face but for me what is what really is difficult to actually get your head around when you're here is the fact that these are carved out of rock i know that sounds kind of simple when i'm saying it but actually when you're there it's really difficult to understand so conditioned are we to understanding buildings as being built that's to say one brick rock breeze block put on top of another until you get to the top and the ceiling and you put a roof on top that to think of a building being carved down from a sheer piece of rock and in through the windows and down again and you know making these extraordinary columns and everything is simply bewildering it's actually very hard to get your head around it's particularly hard to get your head around when you go inside and you see the scale of the places inside uh, St. George's is 18 meters high. That's carving these perfect columns and arches and, and, and uh, carvings in the most fantastic way. And this is 800 years ago. Um, you know, it, it, it really defies belief and trying to get your head around it takes some time. So you just have to kind of go there and be wowed by the wonder of it. They're connected through a series of tunnels and trenches um, so you can get across the uh, get, get kind of round from one one of the churches to another without having to go back up onto the top um, really quite remarkable and absolutely reason enough to go to Ethiopia on its own merit other things you'll do in Lalabella uh, a wonderful cooking lesson we had with uh, Sassy who's a very nice lady uh, and that's me making a complete pig's ear of making um, uh, injera uh, which actually it didn't end up quite as bad as that might look like it did. We also had a coffee ceremony. Of course, coffee was uh, the origins of coffee come from Ethiopia. Buna, as they call it, and they drink their coffee very strong and very black, um, which is how I like my coffee. So that's fine. I love it out there. Um, and uh, you'll have a coffee ceremony in, in quite a few places. But this was a very nice one that we did. The other thing we went to was the high school. Now, I just want to talk briefly about this because this is going to be something that um, I will mention at the end as well. Wild Frontiers Foundation also works with a very good Irish uh, um, charity called Kamara. And Kamara are involved in um, putting reconditioned computers into African schools. And we, uh, through a lot of uh, Wild Frontiers computers, um, put them into this high school in Lalabella. Two different computer labs, 50 computers in all, which were then networked up and enabled the teacher, this chap here, to teach the children between the ages of 15 and 18, not only basic computing skills like typing, like, like using Word and Excel and PowerPoint, but also how to code and how to build websites and stuff like this, which was of course giving them an incredible asset uh, as they left school and went out into the world, they could go to Addis and get some quite serious jobs. 
Unfortunately, during the civil conflict, um, the TPLA occupied Lalabella and ransacked uh, the school and stole or broke basically all the computers. Um, they, they knew what they were doing. They took out the hard drives, they took out the RAM drives uh, and they left empty shells. And so what we want to do is to try and rebuild this uh, computer lab so that these kids can actually get this education again. So I'll talk more about that at the end and how you might be able to help with that. From La Libella, we went on the TESFA Community Walk, which is one of the most brilliant community-based tourism projects um, I've ever come across. It was set up by a former Wild Frontiers guide called Mark, um, oh goodness me, not Mark Stedman, cranky, Mark Chapman, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Mark, <laughs> Mark Chapman, um, who set this up about 15, 20 years ago, I think now. And basically what it is, he's got um, set up 11 camps across Northern Ethiopia, some in Tigray, some in Amhara. Um, and, you, and, and then you walk between the camps. Uh, and the walks range from three hours to seven hours. And the local communities look after you in the camps. They both uh, act as guides. Uh, they take your luggage and they cook for you when you get there. And 60% of the proceeds goes to the communities. The other 40% goes to running the company. So it's a great way of the local communities being able to benefit out of uh, international tourism. And not only that, it's the most fantastic experience for us as tourists. Um, so you kind of drive a bit out of La Labella for about an hour or so. Uh, you get off the road, you take your baggage, you put it on the donkey and off you go on your walk. And you walk through beautiful avenues of eucalyptus. You walk along the escarpment. You can even ride a donkey if you don't fancy walking. Um, and what, of course, this enables you to do, like getting off the beaten track in most places, is see a different world. If you just fly from Addis to Bahadar to Gonda to Lalibela to Aksum and back to Addis, which is what a lot of people do, you don't really see the rural communities um, going about their daily lives. This walk enables you to do that. So here you can see some of our uh, the guys that were helping us. Uh, top right is um, a chap uh, uh, threshing his wheat or teff probably. Teff is what they make the injera out of. It's a high altitude barley. Um, and then the bottom left photograph is what they call winnowing, where you flip the, the grain up into the air, the, 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 uh, the, the stuff on the edge of the grain falls one way and the grain falls down. And that way you can get the grain, which you can then mill. And on the right are the ladies that served us, that cooked us lunch one day. So it's a really nice way of getting to see the local community. And this is where you stay. This is Makuat Miriam. We do this on our group tours. We do this for our tailor-made clients. And it's just spectacular. I mean, there is nowhere more beautiful that I can think of. Um, and you have a loo with a view. Best view from a loo you'll ever get anywhere. Great place to have a sundown, a beer. They provide you with beer and stuff. Um, they'll cook for you. You then do a seven day, sorry, seven hour walk to a place called uh, Wajela, which is where this photograph is taken, where again, you have these incredible views off the escarpment. Um, the accommodation is pretty basic. You're in the local tukals, which are the traditional huts, um, but they have good mattresses, sheets, blankets, pillows, etc. Um, and I actually slept really, really well here. You can see us having breakfast the following morning. Um, in the evening, these people served us food um, and in the morning woke up bottom right with that as our view. So spectacular thing to do and really good way of sustainable tourism, helping local communities. So that was basically my uh, my trip. What 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 um, I'm just going to branch off now into Tigray, which is an area that at the moment is still advised against by the Foreign Office. Mark Chapman, who I was just talking about earlier, he is traveling up there uh, on Saturday to go and see the lie of the land, see how it is. Um, and he will be reporting back. As far as we know, everything's fine up there. Uh, and actually, it's probably one of the safest parts of Ethiopia now. So he'll be traveling up uh, to Aksum. Aksum is famous for a couple of things. First of all, it, uh, it houses, allegedly, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if we go back into historic times, bottom left photograph or illustration, um, the story goes that um, 
the uh the 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 ark of the covenant was smuggled out of uh, jerusalem and taken down to ethiopia for safekeeping by uh menelik the son of solomon and uh, the queen of sheba and every ethiopian church under the ethiopian orthodox religion has to have a replica ark in its holy of holies and on special saints days prayer days they get taken out paraded around the town get followed and then get put away again um, but the real Ark of the Covenant is in St. Mary's of Zion in Axum. Um, the photograph bottom right is just, you, you can see the window just above that little corrugated iron. That's the little place where the Ark allegedly resides. Um, but it's also famous, of course, for being a, a very big and powerful empire over 2000 years ago, the Axumite Empire, which traded, which, which ruled parts of what is today Yemen and traded all the way up to Egypt. Um, and uh, across the Red Sea into Arabia. And it's famous for its stales, these huge monoliths uh, that rise up to 30 meters high uh, above the ground. Nobody's quite sure how they managed to put those up. Just outside of Axum, you have the Sun Temple of Yeha, which is 2,500 years old. You have the rock top church monastery of Debradamo. The only way up to it is uh, scaling a 16 meter cliff face with a camel skin rope. Um, and you have the vertigo inducing um, rock churches of uh, Tigray. These are all pretty spectacular, some of which uh, can be visited, some of which are, are slightly trickier to see. Uh, so just kind of sticking with the north now, um, other great sites are the Danakil Depression, uh, where the, ho the, the, the hottest place on earth uh, drops down to 125 meters below sea level, famous for its salt, uh, which the locals take out on camels. Um, the Dalal uh, sulfur, bath, sulfur uh, lakes are absolutely extraordinary, and you can walk to the top of the Erta Ale volcano. It used to be very tricky to get here. It's become quite a lot easier. It's only a half hour trek to the, to the crater's uh, mouth now. But the Dalal um, uh, uh, sulfur lakes are quite extraordinary. Uh, sulfur springs, they've been investigated to see how life might have originated on Earth and are being seen as to how life might originate on other planets. So uh, lifeless is the environment, but tiny amoebas do live there. Keeping our coming round on this kind of uh, clockwise rotation, we're now down to about four o'clock, I think you'd say, is hurrah. Harar is the um, fourth most important city to Islam. It is home to 82 mosques, three of which were built in the 10th century. Um, Harar was a major trading town, uh, go back into uh, the kind of 1200s and that sort of period. And it was a, a major trading town with links all over um, Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, and indeed further afield into, um, into Arabia. Uh, what it's famous for today is the bottom right picture, which is known as the hyena man. And he feeds hyenas, wild hyenas, from his mouth with pieces of meat, which seems to me like a fairly crazy thing to do. But he seems to do it and still has his face intact. So I guess he knows how. And then coming right the way around to, I suppose, about seven o'clock, uh, the Omo Valley. That is another very famous area for tourism. Um, for the various tribes uh, that live there, the Kara, the Mercy, the Hama, uh, and the Kwegu, to, to name just a few. Uh, they all have their own different uh, ways of, of um, celebrating at festivals, the different looks, the famous um, tongue, uh, sorry, um, lip plate um, people. Um, so that's a, a very interesting element to go uh, and experience. So now just talking quickly about the group tours we have on offer uh, at the moment, the um, Northern Explorer trip, which um, is slightly different to what it used to be, uh, but it includes all the uh, great sites of, um, of the Northern Historical Circuit. As you can see, uh, two plane flights in there, um, but you do the Tesfa village walk, you get to Bahadar, you do the Zegwe Peninsula on Lake Tana, Gonda, Aksum, um, Simeon Mountains, uh, etc. So you do some really nice walking up there. Then we have uh, another trip that takes you to Harar and the Danakil Depression. 
uh, the Erta Ale and the Dalel famous sulfur lakes. Um, and we have a third trip, which is still on the um, on the design floor, you might say, coming soon, Ethiopia Encompassed, which will probably be about 18 days, I should think, and will encompass pretty much all the major highlights of Ethiopia. You'll get the Northern Circuit, so your Bahadars, Gondas, Lalibela, and Aksum, the Danakil Depression, Harar, and the Omo Valley. So keep an eye out for that. We'll be emailing that out um, shortly. And of course, if you prefer to travel tailor-made, we have many uh, tailor-made uh, suggestions. And of course, we can put trips together for you as you like. So just talking about travel practicalities before we go to questions and answers. Um, transport, most likely transport will either be um, a minibus like this, a, a little minibus, uh, if it's just two of you, or the land cruiser, depending on where you're going. If it's part of our group, it will be mostly in the coaster, which is, I think, 22-seater for the 12 of us. Uh, and of course, you're bound to take the odd uh, little short flights around the country as well. Best time of year to visit? Well, that depends if you like everything green or not so green. Um, but basically, you can travel through from September to May. That's really the period that the tourist season is open. Um, and probably the highlights of those at times would be October to March. Festivals. There are quite a few festivals. Obviously, there, there's Easter, there's Christmas, because mostly uh, Ethiopia is an Orthodox Christian country. Uh, but probably the most popular festival is the famous Timcat Festival. This takes place uh, at the end of January every year, where wherever you happen to be, whatever water source you have uh, gets blessed, gets turned into the River Jordan, and everyone in the community gets rebaptized. It's a mass epiphany. All the uh, arcs, the replica arcs, get taken out of the churches uh, and taken. Uh, in a procession down to wherever this water source happens to be. These pictures are all taken from Gonda. So you can see them coming out of the main church there in Gonda, uh, being taken down. There are 13 churches in Gonda. So all these churches bring their arcs out. They all converge in the middle of the town and then they all go down to Facilitad's Bath, which you can see here now filled with water. I don't know if you remember the photograph earlier where it was dry, but now it's full of water. And the priest blesses it at about just as the sun's coming up at about five o'clock in the morning, and then everyone throws themselves in and gets rebaptized. It's quite a spectacular sight. We tend to do Timcat in a rural setting because it's much smaller and much more intimate, and we can uh, have a much uh, better viewing of it. So that's how we tend to do our Timcat. And today, I'm reliably told, is World Heritage Day. So I just thought I'd quickly rip, whip, whip through Ethiopia's UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Of course, you have Lalibela, you have the Simeon Mountains, you have the Gonda Castles, you have Harar, you have the Omo River Valley, you have Aksum, you have the Awash River Valley, and you also have Tyre down in the south. So those are the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, all of which are pretty much viewable uh, on a Wild Frontiers trip. How to get there? Ethiopian Airlines, obviously, is the simplest option. It's actually a really good airline these days. It flies all over the world. It's it's one of the biggest African airlines. It's actually probably one of the biggest world airlines these days. Very good service um, and flies you direct from London to Addis every day of the week. Another option is Turkish Airlines via Istanbul, of course. Do I need a visa? Well, the answer to that is yes, you do. Can I get one on arrival? No, you can't. You used to be able to, but you can't. But actually, don't worry, this is a blessing. Uh, the visa, the online visa service is one of the simplest of all the online visas I've had to do. And I've had to do quite a few recently. It's dead simple. It took me about 15 minutes and I got the visa in 24 hours. You then present that when you get to Addis and boom, you get the stamp in your passport and off you go. The language, well, as you can imagine, with a hundred different tribal makeup, tribal groups, uh, there are a lot of different languages, but the main ones are Hamara uh, and uh, Tigrayan, and the ancient language is Giz, which is what this language is written there. 
If in doubt, speak to our expert, Clem. Clem uh, was uh, traveling around Ethiopia just after me. This is a photograph of her taken even more recently than me being out there. She was out there second half of March. I was out there at the beginning of March. So she has uh, got all the knowledge you would need to uh, put together a really good tailor-made trip if that's how you'd like to do Ethiopia. So finally, I'm just going to quickly talk about other Wild Frontiers destinations that are trending at the moment. Uzbekistan is really popular. Georgia is really popular. We have a load of walking trips in Eastern Europe and even Italy that are proving really popular, particularly Albania, of course, walking in Georgia, um, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Jordan and Oman and, and Egypt, all really doing very well at the moment. Kind of quite bucket list uh, destinations doing very well. So the Wild Frontiers Foundation, as I mentioned, we have our own foundation um, and we raise money through that foundation, uh, through both uh, everyone that travels with us, part of the money that you pay us gets donated to the foundation. And we then uh, help run certain projects around the world. We have our own school in Northern Pakistan, which we built and run, and we have a number of other projects. Uh, but tonight, I just want to bring your attention to this. We are trying to raise £5,000 to rebuild the computer lab in Lalibela to teach those kids how to code, how to build websites, really how to have a future, how to get a good job uh, either in Lalibela or further afield. Um, we will send a link around to this tomorrow. Obviously, we don't charge anything for these webinars, but if any of you felt so inclined, that would be a great thing to do. Uh, and we will try and uh, raise whatever money doesn't get raised, we will try and raise it to the £5,000 so that we can build that, uh, get the computers back in there and get these kids learning once again. Very briefly, um, again, for those of you that don't know us, uh, our maximum group size on group tours is 12. We have tour leaders and local guides, interesting and comfortable accommodation and transport, full board so all meals are included, health and safety protocols, and for tailor-made clients, uh, full team of travel experts. You've seen Clem there who knows Ethiopia very well, expert knowledge, of their areas and we are at all protected. So there you are.